Justin Nevadas. Allison Rampers said. Mary Lise Wante, W A N T E. Daniel Caldas. Chris Morris. Go ahead, sir. State Anybody your name, please. No, it doesn't look like. Go ahead and state your name. Chris Morris, I'm a parent of two kids that are in elementary school. Uh, brings me here tonight, I saw a video on Brain Pop, which is one of the learning modules that they use in elementary school. Video was about George Floyd, okay? Video was about the murder of George Floyd, and a lot of the emphasis in that video had to do with skin color, okay? Not only that, there was also a mention of structural racism in the country, and that parlayed into voting and voting laws. Elementary school. Okay? I don't have to tell you that it's completely inappropriate material for those kids, okay? And it's a socio-political message, okay? I know what that is. You can frame it, say whatever you want to say about it. So my message to you is stay the hell out of my living room, okay? That's my place. If I want to talk about current events with my kids, me and my wife can impart any kind of moral guidance and advice we want to. That's our place. That's our lane. Stay in your lane, Okay? Of course, now I had to look into the uh, equity mission, okay, critical race theory. You, you know, you academics and, and politicians play games with words. We know what it is. 40 minutes of the first training module, okay, with Mary Fertakis, I watched it, all about skin color, skin color, skin color, skin color, race. Are we not past this crap as a society? It's uh, unbelievable, okay? I mean, Palm Beach County is a melting pot. The numbers bear that out, pretty obvious, okay? So I'm telling you right now, if you support this ideology, this philosophy where skin color and group identity matters more than the substance of the individual, you are a racist, okay? Yeah, you shake your head. I see you shaking your head. I'm saying it to your face right now. I'm calling you a racist if this is what you believe, okay? And, you know, when I was watching these videos, the only person I was bringing any kind of real actionable solutions or ideas to the table was Mrs. Andrews, okay? She's the only one doing it again tonight, so I at least want to point that out. Okay, and in addition to being racist, there's no data to support this works. It's a freaking idea that somebody grabbed out of the sky and says, oh, let's try this. Okay, there's no data that says this is going to be any better than anything else. And you know what, Ms. Andrews, thank you for bringing up the fact that uh, Pahokee High School, okay, which I know about Pahokee, was, you know, recognized for an achievement. Okay, how awesome is that? Which segues into the fact that supposedly the system is racist. Interesting, very interesting, okay. And, you know, what does equitable outcome even mean? What, what do we, we want every school in Palm Beach County to be a C school, and we're going to pat each other on the back and say, good job, guys, we did it? What does it even mean? You, you can't define it. You can't say what it is. And, you know, going back to the system is racist, I, I just couldn't pass on this. Um, Mr. Barbieri, you've been here for 13 years. Um, Dr. Robinson, a couple decades. Guess what? You are the system. How does that shoe fit? Okay, Dr. Fenoy. You are a product of the system. And you, sir, are in charge. Does the irony of that not strike you in any way? What I, what I will say is I'm going to go back to the kids. Okay, The kids are pure. They're innocent. Do not try to divide them by looking at each other as skin colors and groups. Okay, Encourage them to love one another. Okay, Teach them that they are individuals. They are all worthwhile. Okay, we're not going to stand by idly and watch you try to corrupt our kids and divide them. It's wrong. It's evil. We're not going to watch it happen. Like many people have said tonight, you have pissed people off. You poked the bear. Okay, you got somebody like me who doesn't want to be Your here, time is, up, sir. is here now, and I'm not going to go away because it's wrong. I've called every name that I have on the list. I've called every blue card. So if you're still in the room and your name hasn't been called, I don't know what to tell you. I have no name for you on the list. And Carson, in the cafeteria, go ahead. So um, I identify myself as Allison today. And I am a mother of four children, a grandmother of nine grandchildren. I am an unhirable nurse. And why do I say unhirable? 
because I know the lies that have been fed to this country over things that cannot even be identified as true. And with that, you all in the school board have taken on such criminal actions, hurting our children and forgetting how you lived your life, how you ate dirt, how you played outside barefooted, how you hugged and kissed on your friends, how you shared saliva with people that you probably didn't even know in a nightclub. <laughs> and you know what? We're still here. We drank water out of a faucet, but for an entire year and a half, we've been telling children to be afraid of those of us that have chosen not to wear a mask. And we're still here. We must be walking miracles because we've been at this for like 54 weeks, mask free, walking around, normal people. My 98 year old father who fought for World War II passed away the day before Thanksgiving last year, healthy as a horse, just passed away because his body gave out. And guess what? He called BS on all this because he couldn't understand why people were covering their face, and he would call it like a facial diaper. He wouldn't even allow nurses to come see him with a facial diaper because he had to read lips because he couldn't hear. And he couldn't read lips of nurses that would come into the house. So guess what? Most of the nurses had to quit because my father wouldn't allow them anywhere near them. We never kept any of our grandchildren from their great grandfather great aunts, great uncles from 98 to 95 to 93 to 89 to grandma over here, almost 60 years old. Never once did we social distance, never once did we wear a mask, and never once did we get sick. Why? Because we took tonic water with quinine, vitamin D3, vitamin C, zinc, OMG, elderberry, and we're all still kicking it. We're all still alive. We're all still happy. We've been together. We've partied. We've enjoyed life. We've hired Santa Clauses so kids could have a normal Christmas. We hired animals so we could have their own petting zoo for kids to come and play with. And we're still here. So unmask our children and stop your BS. Because yes. you know what? We already got you. The number is over with. Bye. Board members, the next hour and 50 minutes would be of recorded messages. We have the opportunity to waive that portion of, of the meeting so that we can get to the discussion item that Mrs. Anders put on um, with the understanding that we would suspend that portion of policy 1.03 that voice recorded messages be played during this meeting provided that those messages that have not been played are sent to all board members to listen and be posted on the website and made available for the public to listen. So if somebody wants to make that motion, we can suspend the, re the uh, hearing of the two hours of recorded messages. Was, uh, the motion was made by Mrs. McQuinn, seconded by Vice Chair Brill. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Mrs. Andrews, you can now start with your discussion item on parental options regarding masks and CDC guidelines. And thank you, Mr. Chair. And first of all, to my fellow board members, I just want to tell you that, you know, this has been heart, heartbreaking to me to hear the moms and the dads tonight talking about their children. And I just want to take a point of personal privilege to say that when the, when the protests happened uh, with, the, with the, uh, the moms and dads about a week or so ago, and their children. I didn't get a chance to go to that. I was busy doing something else. And I saw all those little kids out there holding the signs up with their moms and dads. And, and, when I, when, and they were calling for all of us in this building, all of the school board members as well as the superintendent to come down. And I wasn't here. And these moms and dads, a lot of them live in my neighborhood and all across the district, but they found me. And they said, Miss Andrews, we're looking for you and we ask you to come down. And I said, well, I'm not in the building today. And this says, when will you be in the building again? I says, next week. And I says, when I come to the building, I will speak to you. And so they set the meeting up, and this is how we met. 
and it was one of the most uh, gut-wrenching experiences to see the, the families, the moms and dads, with their little children. Ms. Brill, I thought about you out there that day because it was a little kid with, his, with her dad, and he held her, and she had her hearing apparatus on, on her head, and he was saying that she hasn't been able to get her speech, her speech worked for a whole year. She was behind. And then there were other kids out there, babies, moms with babies, they were out there to talk to me as a board member looking for all of us, but I spoke on behalf of all of us to say that we do care and we want to hear their voices. One of the things they said, and I was happy to hear you say this tonight, Mr. Barbieri, that people were allowed to park here. I was pretty upset when I spoke to the parents last week when they said they had not been treated fairly. They couldn't park here on these grounds that belong to them, and I apologize for that. So I was happy to hear you say that people were able to park over here because there's no reason for us to treat people who live in our neighborhood. These are the, the moms and dads that drive up to the, uh, to the schools every day to drop their children off or, or walk their children to school or a part of us every day at the grocery store and to the movie theater and to the mall. These, that's who you saw in here today. And when I saw the barricades today and all this confusion over here, it made me feel pretty sad. I've been in this district for 40 some years. I had never seen anything like I saw today because moms and dads were coming here. It made me feel so embarrassed as a board member. And I was happy to hear you say that the police out there were trying to get people to park and gave them an opportunity to park because we are of the moms and dads. They put us here to help for their children, and that's why we're in this role. I've spent a lot of time in the school district of Palm Beach County. I don't have to be a board member, but I'm a board member because I care about all children. I really, really do, and I spend my time on the road visiting schools and doing whatever I can do to help. And I felt pretty, pretty humiliated with how people have been treated over the last two weeks, so I'm hopefully hoping tonight when we leave here we can talk about some of these issues that they were talking about because when I wrote this item, I remembered what the moms and dads had told me about their ESC children. I'm on the phone right now every day. When we say we're going to make sure every kid gets back into the school in August, some of the ESC children won't be able to go. Their IEPs don't allow them to be able to do this part. And I've already talked to Kevin McCormick. Uh, I've talked to Keith Oswald and others about what are we going to do for these children. We're not running them to Florida Virtual or Palm Beach Virtual when they have the right, every right to be in the Palm Beach County School District. And when I'm sitting here tonight, and I know at the last meeting we said we were going to open those playgrounds and children could be out there and take their masks off and breathe. And I'm hearing people tell me tonight that that's still not going on. So when I look at all of these pieces, it worries me to death, and we're talking about kids who've gotten discipline referrals because maybe their mask was below their nose, or they took their mask off. The mask was never supposed to be something that we were going to discipline children about. It was supposed to be a health issue to keep people safe. And when I'm hearing people say people are screaming and, 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 and really punishing people and putting them in the corner and putting their heads down, I think, to me tonight, Dr. Fanoa, you have the policy in your hands since the board has elevated that to you, that we could make some, some rules tonight about the things that we need to tell the schools <laughs> as to what they should be doing based on some of this stuff we heard from parents tonight. I, I believe in choice. I told them that. I'm a mom and a grandma, and I really want to be able to say what happens to my kids as they're working through the school district or whatever, and I believe in these parents fighting for their children. We want to keep everybody safe. But some of this stuff I heard tonight is things that we can control right here uh, and, and clear up, just like we did with the uh, kids walking around on the field and PE with a mask, mask and 90 degree temperatures. We stopped that the last time I was sitting here. So as we, I've made a lot of notes of things that we could stop tonight. So I want to open it up to you all to find out what you all want to do. Since Dr. Fanoa is in control of our policy, what are we going to do? Board members, discussion? Mrs. Whitfield and Ms. Brill. 
I would like to keep the policy as uh, Dr. Fenoy stated. I'd like to keep masks until the end of the school year because I believe that um, we haven't had enough time for students who are in the 12 years and up age group to be able to get vaccines. Um, I said um, you know, that I was gonna get my daughter a vaccine as soon as I possibly could. Um, and I'm very glad that I was able to. So on Monday, she got her first vaccine. I kind of feel like that was as fast as I possibly could do it. Um, so she is not gonna get her second for three more weeks. I feel like you know, if parents want a vaccine and they want that opportunity, we need to give them at least enough time to get through the end of this year. And then I think even the summer is a really good opportunity for everyone to get vaccinated, see if we can get some of those vaccines for kids five and up. Um, this disease um, scares me still. And so I don't want um, our children to be hurt by it. And I think that's our responsibility as uh, board members. So I'd like to hang on till the end of the year. And then um, I like the idea that it's gonna be optional next year. I think that's the way that the country's going. That's definitely the way the state's going. I don't think we have as much say with Governor DeSantis. So I don't think it's worth fighting any longer after that. So um, I think, you know, I, I like the way Dr. Fenoy wrote it and I'd like to keep it that way. Thank you. Ms. Brill. Thank you. So I've been sharing with staff and shared with Dr. Fenoy for a, a while. I've been feeling like, you know, we need to, to move to masks being optional. First of all, what I will definitively say, don't get too excited because I'm not all there with you. Um, but, but I will tell you that when it comes to summer school, I think at this point, uh, I'm really concerned about the children being in, in the hot buildings wearing masks. I'm worried about compensatory education for our ESC students. I'm worried, you know, it was heart-wrenching listening to the parents and also reading the emails from the parents on the other side. Um, I know it's scary for people to take their masks off. That I know. I know that, you know, when I first started taking my mask off, it was frightening. But I think that we're at a point now where we can do that. So, I, you know, I definitively don't want to see masks after school ends. I'll, I'll yield to the majority of my board. I'm ready to say make it optional. Um, I really think that, I think that at this juncture, the adults are getting vaccinated. I do believe that the, the spread isn't there. School's almost over, but if we have to keep them in place till the end of the year, as long as we can end it at that point. I do not wanna take the authority away from the superintendent though. Should there be a change with the virus? Should there be a change with the variants? Just so you know, I mean, I have a daughter that lives in Sao Paulo, so I know about the variants and I know about what the issues are with them. We have to have the ability to keep the students safe. But I agree with you that right now, we're at that point and, I tr and I, we have to trust each other and work together. And, and that's something that we need to do. Um, but you know, that's, that's my opinion. Any other board members? Dr. Robinson. Thank you. Um, so first, let me just say, um, while I disagree with some of the things that were stated as fact, um, I fully support your right to speak up and to be your mama bear, somebody said it, right? Um, and there's no way I would try to um, deny your experiences. Now, I got a couple things. So I don't know where this concept of mandating a vaccine came from. Let me just cross that off the list now, at least for me. I, it's, that's inconceivable to me, right? The issues around um, the services for the um, children with disabilities, I think the stories told tonight um, painted the picture clearly, right? Like, um, and so we still, we have to figure out what we're going to do, right? This whole time going into this pandemic, I knew it was gonna be horrible. I knew that we were gonna have academic slide. Um, there were some problems just in terms of day to day that I did not foresee um, like I did not think that the simultaneous teaching was a good idea. I now see that it was way better than what I thought, at least for students, maybe not for teachers, right? But um, 
And so all of this is trying to make the very best decision with the information that you have, right? Um, so just a couple things. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm a retired internal medicine physician, so I'm sure, you know, my viewpoint is, is swayed um, for good or bad, depending on what your opinion is. But um, somebody asked, who are we trying to protect? I'm trying to protect everybody. I just had this thing in my head where there is life, there is hope, right? I think that the, um, this concept of zero deaths, well, it's not, but it's, this virus is horrible. It's not just about the deaths. There's gonna be long-term consequences in adults and children who have mild cases of this virus, right? I, in my magical world, I would prevent all cases of COVID. As one of the speakers over here said, we're not gonna get to zero risk. I understand that. But I still believe in risk mitigation. We open schools um, in September. I was against that too. I'm, I'm more cautious than everybody else up here, I think. But maybe that's because of my experience as a physician and my conversations with my colleagues who are still practicing and the nurses who are just completely wiped out from caring for people, um, dying or being very sick from this. So, okay, I'm sorry, I'm rambling. But when we opened schools, we opened, we had that goal of that 5% daily positivity rate, which seemed to be like this national metric. We opened with mass six foot, six foot social distancing, the hand washing, the improvements in the ventilation system. We know now kids are going back in school. Kids who are virtually learning are going into school for testing. We are, you know, some of the six schools cannot maintain social distancing at six feet. Um, you know, and, and the reports that came out a few weeks ago about three feet actually said three feet or as much as possible, but the headlines missed that rest of that part, right? And I cautioned in this room that we not let our guard down then. Um, I, I am very concerned about what will happen if, um, if we drop the mask at this point in time. I been and I rambled at this dice before about looking for a metric. Well, as it happened, I actually, um, listened to and then read Dr. Scott Gottlieb, who was the FDA director under President Trump, who said that we sh he thought we could lift precautions um, when we got to less than, and this is a dis different metric, um, less than 10,000 new cases daily. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, 10, case, 10 cases daily per 100,000, and then he said, but if you want to be conservative and safe, it would be five, right? So right now, Palm Beach County, the latest one, I think we're at 13. So we're not, we're not there, like, by his measure, right? And then, okay, so, you know, I had some questions about the CDC myself, but, um, you know, the, we, I've, gotten communications from the Florida Academy of Pediatrics, the board president from the Palm Beach County Medical Society, the Telerroy Jefferson Medical Society. We got a letter that was signed by, I think it was 20 something physicians who, who all of them were saying don't end mask yet, right? But I hear you, right? So like I'm a little bit torn, but I have, as a, I have to err on the side of caution and say, that I don't want us to drop the mask mandate right now. I am like prayerful and hopeful that, that the metrics will be such that we can drop it in the foreseeable future. I actually did not like Dr. Fenoy's letter because I wanted him to say, we'll see later what we'll do in August, but I can live with, I'm hoping, Lord knows, I'm hoping that the numbers will be low enough so we can be optional. Um, but, you know, right now, right now, I have to err on the side of caution. And so I'm not yet, um, 
I'm not yet willing to drop the mask mandate. I've been, I hear people quoting studies. I'm like pulling up studies myself, trying to see if it's something I missed. I read, I, I think I read every email that came in. I think I clicked on every link, right? Um, many of the emails that I received that had links summarized the links differently than I would have summarized them. Some of the links didn't work. Um, so just, I mean, know that, you know, I, as far as I'm concerned, it's not an easy answer. Um, and I, I'm just, I'm not comfortable with dropping the mask mandate yet. I'm, I want to see those numbers come down. I think, um, you know, I want to see what the health advisory committee says, but, you know, I've talked to enough physicians, um, and epidemiologists that I just, I can't make myself your, the stories were um, impactful. I, I just can't make myself do it because of, of what I know about disease transmission. So thank you. Go ahead, Mrs. Andrews. I'm sorry, Mrs. Whitfield, but I had to bring down your name. You already spoke, right? Yes, Mrs. Andrews. I, I think the superintendent needs to send something out to the schools because these parents and moms and dads that's talking here tonight about how their children are being treated at the schools, it needs to be addressed. If we say the playgrounds are open and children can go out without their masks and be in the playground, just like that one lady said, put a sign out there to the playground to say no masks at the playground, if, especially if you're six feet away or whatever. We need to make sure our playgrounds are open. Last week I had two kids that uh, had a fainting situation. The principal was really nice. The parents called me and I called the school and they took care of the children. But kids are still out there wearing masks at the playground. Now we can do better than that. We need to, we need to send something out to the schools. There should be no discipline referrals if someone has a mask below their uh, nose or if they forgot it or if it's after school and they put it in their pocket, you know, we're sitting up here. We've been sitting up here for hours and you know I'm ready to take my mask off and I'm sure you all are too. And these children are doing the best that they can. When we heard tonight, and this is what I heard when I was standing out there, how kids are running to the bathroom just to get a, a breathing break. It was interesting, I read from one principal, and I'm not gonna call the name because I surely don't want there to be a problem, but that principal in that school gave their children a few minutes to have a breathing break. I don't know why we can't do little things like that. I know we have to keep the mask on, but you can tell when your children are in, are in anxiety, and we talked about that here tonight. Children are in anxiety wearing them and not having a minute to take a breather, and so they have to ask to go to the bathroom. I heard it from all of these uh, moms and dads that were with me and on the emails. They run to the bathroom just to get a breathing break. Something's wrong with that. And we can do better than that. And this is where I talked to Dr. Fanoa, you're the administrator of this district, that something needs to go out to the schools. We only have a few more days left for this year that can encourage the principals to use common sense and good judgment. You know if a child is in distress or some kind of issue is there, work with them. The masks were never supposed to be a discipline tool if they didn't follow through. And we know when you can get outside and get some air, we've been stuck in this building for the last few hours. We need to get out of here, okay? And get some fresh air. Let these children get some air. And if the teacher has to take her class out for a minute to get some air, if it's some kind of situation, they should have some kind of autonomy working with their principal and their school to help these children. We should not have any more cases of bullying and uh, discipline referrals and mental breakdowns because kids are frightened if they just touch their mask and it goes down for a minute to get some air and they get called on it. That, you need to do something, Mr. Superintendent, to let the principals know, let's have a good year for the rest of the year since it seems like we're going to be sticking with what you have said in your letter to help these children and these families make it for the next couple of weeks. That's my, my, my thought on that. I don't know what you all think, but I think something needs to go out. Ms. Ayala. Thank you. Okay, so I'll start by saying that I wanna thank everybody who came out tonight and took time out of their night to speak. I don't think there's anything more important than 
this these kinds of conversations with your public officials. So I'm glad we have this ability for discourse and to hear everybody's perspective. Um, that being said, I know that this is emotional and has been difficult for everybody involved, parents, students, everyone here, everyone in a school, everyone who has been involved in education has gone through a year that no one will forget. Um, up here, I know that this is emotional, but we can't afford to make decisions on emotion. We are overseeing the health and safety of the largest employer in Palm Beach County, as well as nearly 200,000 students who are depending on us for safety recommendations. So when I'm look, I'm speaking, so please wait until you're called upon. If we look at what I have and I'm looking at the science, first of all, recorded speakers haven't been listened to yet and I have a feeling they might feel a little bit differently than those who came out tonight in person in a large crowded room, they'd have different things to say. Second of all, there are still highly contagious variants out there and that's combined with the fact that we don't know the long-term health effects of getting COVID-19. Have we thought, you know, that, that was said by, I know that you all don't like Dr. Alonzo, but that remains a fact. Third, CDC recommendations for schools have remained the same, and this has been based on the fact that option and choice, and I know we're all fans of choice here, to vaccinate students is not yet available for every single child, meaning those who want to get vaccinated and have every right cannot yet do that, and they cannot feel safe sending their child into a school system without that choice. We will have updated information from the CDC and other medical experts that are not just within our county within the coming weeks. I cannot support in good conscience moving what we have already decided, changing the rules in the last month of this school system without all of the facts. And right now we do not have all of the facts. So I will support what the superintendent sent out. We will end the year. We will look forward to getting out of this pandemic and coming out ahead of it and we will stick to the facts and we will stick to protecting kids and teachers and adults who work for our system because they have kept it running. So I cannot support removing the mask at this time. Board members, I need a motion to extend. Let's try half an hour at a time. Let's extend to 12.30 a.m. Do I have a motion? Mrs. Mrs. Andrews, seconded by Vice Chair Brill. All in favor, opposed. The motion passes. The meeting is now extended for another half an hour. Dr. Robinson, I believe you were next. No? Okay. Um, so I just want to circle back. Um, thank you, um, Mrs. Andrews, for talking about the brain breaks. But what that means to me is how afraid our staff is, right? And so I think part of this has to be some circling back around and educating the staff. The viral load in the community is starting to decrease. You know, I don't have the same level of anxiety as I had in September, right? Um, you know, some of our adults have been vaccinated. Some cannot get vaccinated. But, um, but I think we need to tell the, explain to the principals and the teachers that they don't have to be quite as hypervigilant, right? Just because, I mean, kids are kids. We, we knew this going in. One of the arguments in the beginning was kids won't keep their mask on. Okay, so you can encourage them to keep their mask on without screaming at them or some of these things that were just completely inappropriate. But I think that that's out of their own fear. Um, so I think that we just need to make sure that we're educating them. Um, but the other thing I wanted to um, lift up that was said that is really on point that I think got lost in some of this is we do need to... And Ms. Whitfield's gonna love this. We really do need to push the proper nutrition angles, right? Um, and the whole like be healthy, stay, stay healthy thing, right? Um, not that that is a substitute for, for I'm still with six feet y'all um, and or mask, but, um, but I think that, that, that we, we need to be proactive that way, um, so. I'm done, thank you. Mrs. Whitfield. I just wanted to tell the parents that are here tonight, um, if you feel your children are being bullied at school, please tell us, like we don't, no, I mean, send us an email about the specific incident. Okay. Please, please. Just let me finish speaking, okay, please. What I'm saying is that we don't believe that anyone should be bullied. I actually would prefer if you wouldn't bully us. I think that would be great. I feel that 
um, your children are really important, and I want them to feel loved and welcomed in school. And I, if they are not feeling that way, um, tell us the specific incidents of what happened, who said it, and we will look into it. We are very good about this. We have staff that will come out and they will, they will make sure that this doesn't happen. I don't want any child to be yelled at ever, not by a teacher, not by a principal, not by a person on campus. Those stories really hurt me to hear from you because it's very important to me. Yeah. I think if it would help people to understand, um, you know, in the district, we can continue to send out communications and I would support um, sending out, as Ms. Andrews was talking about, communications to really emphasize that when you're outside, kids don't have to wear masks. I think that that was a very prudent thing that this board did last week or two weeks ago. And so I would like to really emphasize that. I'd like to say, you know, give your children an opportunity to have breaks and I'm sorry, you can't ask questions anymore. You guys are done. Um, so we are, I think that that's something that we can do as a, as a board and really make sure that we're getting our communications out there. Um, and I think we can look into what's happening during the summer, but I, I just really, I don't want to get rid of them until the end of the school year at this point. I just don't think it's smart. And I want to make sure that we take care of our kids. And that, that's, that's where I'm sitting. Thanks. Please, please, no more questions. Let the board discuss. Board members, the, sorry, please. Please stop talking or we'll ask you to leave. We have to get through this meeting, so stop talking. Mr. Superintendent, you need to get something out to the schools to tell them that we don't discipline the children if they take off their masks. Just to encourage them to put them back on, like I did tonight with grown-ups. And they, most of the time, they listened when I told them to put them back on. The children will, too. There should be no more penalties, no more detentions, no more bullying children to, to put the mask on. Just please get something out to the schools. Let's discuss the playgrounds. Now, there's, I thought that you said that the kids wouldn't wear masks on the playgrounds, but when I talked to a couple principals, they were told that the kids have to be six feet apart in order to take them. Well, God knows that these kids are going to be out there playing, especially the elementary school kids. They're going to be closer to, than six feet together. So what is it? Are we going to let the kids play outside together without their mask on? Or are we going to say they have to play together, but they have to be six feet apart, which is not going to work in the elementary schools because those kids want to sit down next to each other and play mm -hmm. in the swings next to each other next to each other and go down the slide next to each other. I mean, what are we doing with the kids on the playground? So on the play, so this is, this is what I'll say to the board. What do you want? Just tell me exactly what you remember. The policy is very clear. I can make it happen, but just like with the letter, I didn't send out the letter without talking to you first. So if you want no six feet in the playground, if you just tell me, we'll make it happen in the morning at our, at our, at our direct report meeting. So just give me the direction and we will make it happen. Board members, a show of hands of who would like to see the kids play outside without masks on on the playgrounds. I would like to say something first. Go ahead, Mrs. Thank McQuinn. You. I haven't said much. You didn't raise your hand or would have called on you, ma'am. Well, I didn't know you were going to call for a vote yet. Anyway, I have something to say about this. Okay. Um, it really didn't occur to me, and I, and I heard Dr. Alonzo tonight, that when kids go outside that they would be six feet apart even when they're playing um, uh, soccer they're not six feet apart and I, and I realize about the expelling you know spit and all that stuff but to me it's unreasonable to be six feet apart and I'm going to go back to um, my very first principal um, Luke Thornton and there was all this, remember, I'm really old, and there was all this debate about the length of girls' skirts. And, you know, like, are we going to measure fingertip length? And he said, you cannot legislate common sense. And I think we have to do that when we're outside. Um, you know, let's not have the kids join hands and do ring around the rosy or something. But they ought to be able to go out and play with one another. Um, so I, that having been said, yes, I do support that we don't have the six feet social distancing on the playground and that we not try to legislate common sense. Okay, okay so I just want to remind you all, we're not allowed to vote at a, at a, at, at, on a discussion item, but we can take a consensus to give the superintendent direction. Can I say something before you ask what your Go ahead, Dr. Robinson. Okay, so let me tell you, I, when we had that conversation before, I did not really foresee that we were gonna say they had to stay six feet apart. 
Now, I do, that's, that's the answer on the test, okay? That's what the public health experts would say. I do think it's, it's hard to enforce and it becomes just more room for harsh activity. How about that? Um, but they're outside. And so that gives me some level of comfort. Now, you know, am, will I be encouraging kids to be close to each other, even if they're outside? No. <laughs> but I also do want us to start stepping back to like some degree of normal. And, and that's the one that I thought I was supporting before, right? But I just want to acknowledge that the answer on the public health test remains six feet, even though you're outside. So I, I'm just, you know, but, but first of all, I just want to tell you all that are still here. I have three grandchildren in the school, so you know what? You can tell me to drink the dirty water if you want to, but you know, I care about the, my grandkids and the, and the kids that are in their classrooms with them. So, you know, criticize us all you want to. We got, we're big people up here and we probably can take that criticism. But, you know, I don't understand how, and you know, we are lay people other than Dr. Robinson. We have, we have relied on CDC guidance and the state health department. The CDC changes its guidelines as often as I change my stocks. So, I mean, it's difficult for us to make a decision when the experts are telling us something different than what we really think, maybe, in our own hearts, what we should do. We also get hundreds of emails, some from doctors that are telling us, like the ones that Dr. Robinson mentioned, that God help us if we take the masks off the kids. And other doctors, doctors, medical doctors, are telling us to take the masks off the kids because it's safe. So, you know, you all need to understand that we're not up here making our own rules. We're trying to figure out what the medical professionals are telling us to do, and they're not consistent. So at this point, the district has been following the CDC guidance and the state health department. What I don't understand is how we can have kids playing on the football field and on the basketball courts without masks on, but we're required, we were requiring kids to wear masks on the outside. I don't know how we came to the decision that we were going to allow that to happen on the football fields and the basketball courts, but in the meantime, kids can't take their masks off outside. So certainly, we've tried it, and it seems to be working. We have no infections in the schools where the kids have been playing basketball together. We have no infections where they've been playing football on the football fields together. So we've got a test out there that shows that we haven't had any infections. So we should get rid of the mask mandate for any kids that are outside playing whatever they're doing outside. They should be able to take their masks off once they get out of the building. With respect to summer school, I think that we should probably start taking the masks off as soon as summer school starts and make it, make it voluntary. You need to understand, we made a deal with the parents that send their kids back the second semester. We told the parents that were willing to send their kids back that we would require masks if they sent their kids back to us, and they did. It is not fair to those parents, whether there's 8,000 or 2,000 or 100,000 kids that came back to school with their parents thinking that the kids were going to be safe because everybody was going to wear a mask. Can you just give us 20 more days till the end of the school year? Well, it's not your decisions. I shouldn't have said, can you give us? This board can make the decision that we're going to wait for the 20 days for the school year to end, and then at that point, we make the mask voluntary for the, for the summer school. Stop talking. I'm not asking you for your opinion. I'm sorry I ask you to, you know, can you, give, can you give us 20 days? I think at this point, we made a deal with the parents that send their kids back, that we would keep their kids safe. They believe the kids are safe with their mask on. We need to honor that commitment we made to those parents, because at this point, the for those parents to try and pull their kids out that are afraid now for 20 days of school when the kids have to take tests and everything else is not fair to those parents. And the kids can, can deal with it for 20 more days. Let's take the masks off during the summer school and see how that fares before we have thousands and thousands of kids back in the school system, back in the classrooms. Uh, so ma mandating vaccine, Dr. Robinson mentioned it. Nobody on this board has ever mentioned that we're gonna mandate a vaccine. And I certainly would never ever mandate that I have two granddaughters, and my daughter said she doesn't want to get them vaccinated until she's sure that there's no effect on their reproductive system. So we're not going to mandate that for anybody. Parents, you make the decision whether you want to get your children vaccinated. The school board is never going to make that decision for you. We've been doing things that the, that the, that the CDC has, has given us guidance on, and that was the mask policy that we put in place. Uh, there's been no recommendation from them, and I certainly would not vote, even if they did recommend that we mandate child vaccines, I would not vote for that. And I, I don't think that my colleagues on this board would vote for that, vote for mandating vaccines in any event. So that's my position on all of this. 
I think we should keep the mask in place at the end of the school year. They'd be optional for the summer school program. No mask for kids outside, whether they're playing or they're leaving the school to go home for the day. Once they walk out the door of the school building, they take off their mask and they walk to their cars, to the, wherever they're going next, and they take their masks off. I believe there was a couple of other hands. Ms. Brill and Mrs. Andrews wanted to go after me. Thank you, and I agree with you, Mr. Barbieri, but I, I do want to say that there are teachable moments that come out of all of this, and in speaking to the parents on both sides, just looking ahead down the road, we are going to have to teach the students, especially the younger ones, there are going to be students that are going to need to wear masks when we make it optional. And parents on both sides were telling me they were concerned about bullying of those students mm -hmm. and that we're going to have to teach them that, you know, that every child has differing, differing needs. So just putting that out there for down the road. Um, parents on both sides were very supportive. Um, the parents of the, that want masks to be optional have said the, how they've talked to their children about how some of their friends may have to wear masks, but we're gonna have to look, look to do that in the future. Mrs. Andrews. And this is the last thing for ESC. Um, these children have suffered so much. So many of our children have suffered, but our ESC children with their IEPs not being recognized uh, this year have truly suffered. And now that we're saying that everybody has to come back to brick and mortar, uh, I'm worried about some of the ESC children whose IEP tells them that they may not be able to do that. Now, I've been talking to uh, uh, Mr. McCormick, and I guess we have to get some kind of uh, okay from the state as to whether some of these people can do a little bit of virtual as well as brick and mortar. But these parents are suffering because they feel, many of the, uh, the ESC parents, the special ed students, uh, parents, and the children feel that the district is just pushing their children aside, not giving them information in a timely manner, whether you're gonna be able to honor their IEPs and the 504s and things like that. So we really need to make sure that we're answering the questions, and Ms. Dr. Sheffield, they said you were part of that too, with whatever you all are writing up to, to, to make sure that we meet each child's individual education plan, and it may call that they cannot step back in the building. And I don't wanna see any parent having to leave the school district of Palm Beach County to go to Palm Beach Virtual or Florida Virtual because we couldn't honor their IEP and the parents are really nervous. They call me every single day asking me. I've called Mr. Oswald, so I really want you to get it done. Whatever it is you need to get done from the state to take care of these children. The special ed children and their parents have been suffering so much, and they need help. So let's take a consensus on a couple of things so the superintendent knows whether, whether he has a consensus of the board. Summer school, mass optional. Yes. See a show of hands for a consensus on that. Yes. No. Why don't you start with the easier ones first? Sorry. Can we do that one last? <laughs> Can we do that, that one? Last? <laughs> okay. Um, outside, no mass. Once once a child leaves the building, no mass. Whether he's playing or he's gone home, coming to school in the morning, doesn't put it on until he walks in the building. We okay with that? Okay. So let's see a show of hands that are yes. Show of hands that are no. Mr. Superintendent, the board by six uh, with Dr. Robinson not agreeing uh, would, would like you to make sure that the schools know that effective as soon as possible, once the child steps out of the building, that no masks are required on school board. Mr. Barbieri, unless they go on a bus. If they're on a bus, I'd like to know where yeah, masks If they go on, on the bus, because they're all confined on the bus, they should have the masks on the bus. But otherwise, when they're walking outside in the fresh air, they should be able to take their masks off. Yeah, okay, can you just put that on the list for our conversation tomorrow, please? Mr. Barbier. You want to make a comment on that? Go ahead, Dr. Robinson. My only comment was, um, I was, I was going to suggest as soon as they get off of the school district property. I mean, at parent pickup, there's a whole lot of movement. Um, and so, you know, I would just have that little, the qualified. I appreciate the sen sentiment. I'm not 100% against it. I just think I would put it like the moment they get off the school district property, it's all good just because of parent pickup. Because when we, when we said before, when we were talking about the playgrounds, and I think we said outside, I got a lot of concern the next day about parent pickup and the potential for mingling, right? So that's all. 
Mrs. McQuinn, you had your hand up. Mrs. McQuinn. Okay, thank you. Um, in the board's defense, Dr. Fenoy, um, we, I can tell you that when I agreed to, to um, that we would keep the masks, and at the time we didn't even know about the CDC saying in schools, but through the end of the year, and I, at the time I really wanted to, um, I think we need to relook at summer school. I mean, who knows what can change with summer school, so I think we all agree on that. But honestly, it never occurred to me that outside we would still be six feet apart. So a little bit of defense on our part, because then when the actual clarification went out to schools, it had the six feet. So that was something that we had not discussed. Felt the need to defend ourselves there. Um, so for me, I would like to see us revisit summer school. I think there's plenty of time to do that. Um, be it, it, there's plenty of time for us to do that. No masks outside, and and I hear Dr. Robinson, but let's when the kids when they're out, let's just let them be out. It it gets so hard for all those teachers to uniformly enforce what they need to do. So I think we don't make that complicated and. It, I, I, all of our elementary schools that I see have very organized dismissals, so I don't see that as a too big of a deal. All right, how about not, no discipline for children to take their masks off, they're encouraged to put them back on, so no more, no more detentions, no more penalties, no more putting them in the corner. Yeah, Show of hands, yes. Yeah. Show of hands, no. That one's 7-0 on that one, so we can take care of that one. Um, Summer school, so Mrs. McQuinn has suggested that we don't deal with summer school tonight. We wait and see. Honestly, I, and I have to interject, I, I actually would prefer the board give us direction tonight because the decision is going to impact whether or not we can get the teachers to come. So I need to know that now if we have to downsize summer school because we can't get staff. Mrs. Andrews. We've already lost 6,000 students here in Palm Beach County that we're trying to find, and people are saying each day that they're going to move their children out. When we think about summer school, I don't want someone not to uh, come to summer school because we have the mass mandate. You know, we're trying to get all these children back. I think, uh, Dr. Sheffield, you said 52,000 children that you've already identified pretty much who have some unfinished learning, and we want them to participate, and so when in a lot of the districts right close by us, they're opening summer school with an option right here in our neighborhoods, right in this tri-county area. So I believe that we need to not do that because I think we're going to lose some summer school children and we are trying to move these children back to get the learning that they've lost, uh, the unfinished learning. So I think that we are doing better and I would love to see us make sure it's optional for summer school. Ms. Ayala. And Dr. Robinson. Thank you. Going back to the outside maskless conversation, are we talking about what teachers are going to be able to do or not do, or is this just about students? Board members? I'm just trying to clarify and for I our think administration. Teachers are included. I mean, the risk is low, so I think teachers should be included. I'm sorry, Ms. Whitfield, what did you say? I'm sorry, I didn't raise my hand. I think teachers should be included, and they can take their masks off as well. McQuinn? I've gotten a few um, emails from teachers asking when, when the guidelines came out, it referred to the student policy, and they wanted to know if they were allowed to take those off too. So I think that it, it does need to be clarified, and I have no idea what the intent was. I just assumed what students could do, teachers could do, but I don't really know that. So I think we need to make that clear. Yeah, I did not I did not do that for adults because we had not discussed it. So I only put in the letter the things that we discussed as a board. So if we want the adults to take the masks off, and I, I have no problem with it, but I would need direction from the board because what I don't want is my staff being yelled at by the board for doing these things. So let's be very clear today what we want so that we can put that in writing and we can get that out. That's what I'm trying to do, Dr. Fenway. That's why we're taking a consensus. So board members... Let me see a show of hands that the adult, when the kids can take their masks off, that the adults that are with them can take their masks off also. 
That's seven zero, Dr. Fenoy. So the teachers, when they walk outside, the assistant principals or principals, mm -hmm. people in this building, when they go outside the building, they can take their masks off while they're in school board property as long as they're outside, outside the building. Yeah. Doc, uh, Dr. Robinson, you were next, go ahead. So, you know, I don't know, I feel like we are making decisions without explaining the why, right? So I just wanna explain <clears throat> my why, why I supported that for the adults because the adults could have been vaccinated, right? The other thing I wanna just mention that I intended to mention before is the masks are really about um, source control, meaning when I wear my mask, I'm actually protecting you more than I'm protecting me, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, it, it's clear. But, and so it's kind of like um, texting while driving. We have laws that say you can't text while drive because, driving because if you do, you can harm yourself, but others too. It's not like the safe um, seat belt, where if you don't wear your seat belt, you just harm yourself. And okay, I know that's a bit much, it's late. But I'm, my point is, instead of just, I, ju I just, I'm just trying to get you to understand my train of thought, because I have to process this around the public health thing. So we go into summer next? Because I'm at my Superintendent has asked comments. us to come to a consensus on what okay. we want to do with summer school with respect to the mask being voluntary or not voluntary. Okay, so my issue, can I walk through this too? Go ahead, Dr. So Lee. this is, um, so first off, because the numbers are lower, the expected number of children is, for summer schools is lower, I would hope that we can maintain six foot so social distancing. I am not comfortable with the concept that we would make masks um, voluntary and, and questionably be questionable on social distancing. But the other thing, the other reason I'm really hesitant about summer dropping the mask is just statistically, it's more likely that the children that would need to go to summer school are in higher risk conditions, right? Higher risk or maybe have family members in higher risk. And so, you know, I have to think about that. So it makes me uneasy. I really want to say yes. Um, but I can't. Mrs. Whitfield. So I was just um, kind of wanted to discuss this summer option more. What if we um, made summer kind of a step down process where if they were sitting at their desks, they don't have to wear the mask, but just in transition times, they wear a mask in the building. So when they're around a lot of people or, you know, just to make it a little bit better so that they ha can have that breathing break um, you know, when they're, when they're sitting at their desk and if they are six feet apart, that would give it, yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm still a little stuck on summer because I, I really think that we're a little bit too fast um, and I, I'm okay with August, but the issue with summer for me is really that the families that want a vaccine may not have had the opportunity to get one yet and, and, I, and they need three weeks after the first shot to get the second shot and then two weeks to be fully covered. I, it's summer's just really close. So um, that's that's why I'm hesitant on it. I think I would just, I would vote for masks, but I'm, I'm willing to give a little bit of leeway personally, if you guys are okay with it, to have, you know, when they're sitting at their desks, they don't have to wear it if they don't want to. Mrs. McQuinn, how do you feel? About summer school? Yes, ma'am. Well, since I can't delay it, then I say we um, we keep it, not optional. However, as Dr. Fenoya said before, I mean, if we have information, we can change that. But right now, if we have to make a decision right now, then we, we, we're we not going to have optional until August 10th. Ms. Ayala. I agree. I want to remain the course that the superintendent laid out in the letter that was sent out. And I also wanted to make a point earlier that I didn't get to. Um, I know he called me when he was sending out that letter and before he sent out that letter to gain input, and I'm pretty sure he called all of us. So tonight there's been some, uh, you know, lines for applause and some political grandstanding that I don't think has been fully fair. I just want to make it very clear to the public that he called every single one of us to ask for input before that letter went out and everyone had a chance to comment. Thank you. Mrs. Whitfield. 
sorry, I just wanted to clarify one little part about where we said um, being outside. If a high schooler is in one of those big courtyards, we count that as outside, right? Yes? Outside okay, I'm just checking. I want to make sure that that's part of the memo. Mrs. Andrews? Optional? Dr. Robinson? Ms. Brill? Okay, let's go again. A show, let me see a show of hands of optional for some summer school. Optional for summer school. Not optional with the requirement. I would vote for optional, but the but consensus of the board is that they stay mandated for summer school. Okay. Are we done with this discussion item for tonight, Mrs. Andrews? Do you have anything else? We have other discussion items to get to. Okay. The next discussion item is Mrs. Brills on the equity statement. Thank you, and I, I know it's I know it's late, but um, I've been grappling with this. It's not going to take long. Don't worry, Mrs. McQuinn. But um, but I've been grappling with this for for a week and a half. The staff knows on how to handle it. It's very important that we create equitable and inclusive schools and that we ensure students have what they need to be successful in school and in life. And that's what I fought for for years when paving the way for students with disabilities to be welcomed into the regular education classroom. And that's what our equity statement says. I do not believe that the language in the equity statement was intended to be divisive and polarizing. It should not make anyone feel disenfranchised. It is evident that a few of the words are not helpful and, in fact, are harmful. I've discussed with general counsel the proper parliamentary procedure to allow me to recall or reconsider my vote on the equity statement this board adopted on May 5th, 2021. She has advised me that the time for making a motion to reconsider has passed, but has also advised that there is no limitation on the time we can amend the equity statement previously adopted. To that end, it only takes four of us tonight to request that the superintendent make a motion to amend the equity statement to the next board's, uh, board meeting agenda. I'm suggesting we amend the statement by removing the words that are highlighted on what was passed out and what was attached. By removing those words, and if I need to read them, I will, um, but by removing those words, I do not believe we are in any way weakening our position. Mr. Chair, if there is consensus by at least four of us, I would like to ask that the following agenda item be added to the June 2nd agenda, motion to amend the equity statement adopted by the board on May 5th, 2021, by removing the language highlighted on the attached. Do we have a second? Ms. Andrews seconded that. So under discussion, under discussion, Mrs. McQuinn? Well, all right, I'm confused. We're voting on this no, right no, now. No, we're, we're just we're discussing okay, it. Okay. So well, we, you said a second, so I want to. I, mean, I, I have sorry, a comment. A second. I meant. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad I'm not in charge. I'm just, happy that you're it's, actually it's, keeping it's, this together. It's, it's getting late. In fact, uh, okay. I, need a, I, I had a communicated hold on, hold on with. We need a motion to extend the meeting for another half an hour. Motion by Mrs. Um, Andrews, second by Mrs. Whitfield. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. The motion meeting is now extended to 1 a.m. The, the reason um, with Mrs. Brill saying that I, she wouldn't be long is I think this is so important that I don't want to, to have a consensus decision. I had already asked Mr. Tierney um, to, I thought this was very appropriate, and I think we've all been communicated with now that we do this at next week's equity workshop in terms of specific words. I, so that was my hope. So I don't have a problem with going on the agenda, but I don't want to do specific wording right now. Mrs. Whitfield. I'm, I'm a little curious um, what you guys think about uh, this. We had said we weren't gonna socialize this um, at our previous meeting. So if we bring it back and change some of the words, do you wanna um, have any moments where we discuss with the community what we've come up with afterwards? Or, you know, I'm, I'm kind of thinking like forward, if we go, we make some changes, then people might come back to us with even more changes. And that, that worries me because it is supposed to be a positive thing. I thought it was a good thing. Um, but do you wanna go out and socialize it and, you know, have meetings where we discuss it? Is that part of the plan? Whitfield, are you responding to Ms. McQuinn's question? 
No, I'm just saying if we if we make this change and we bring it back out and we are, it's no longer approved, so we have to go back and approve it, do we want to like put that off and, and have time to socialize it and get it out in the community? It's a kind of a separate question for everyone. Ms. McQuinn? Okay. I definitely think we need to socialize it. I objected, and many of us know, that I objected to our individual district meetings to talk about something that, um, so we put it out there. We've had so many hours of working together, um, you know, with a facilitator to understand. We all understood, but I knew the general public would not understand that. And so for me, it's, yeah, put it out there and let's get reaction. We've, we've had plenty. I think now it is time, and, and that's my hope, was that we could talk about it more at the workshop. We've all gotten input, some of us collectively, some of us individually. We bring that to the table, and then we actually have an open meeting and let people, but I don't want to go out district by district, because frankly, it's not my neighborhood, it's our neighborhoods. And so I think this is something we do as a board, and we let the public comment on it. Mrs. Brill. Thank you. So I just do want to make a comment that a part of the problem that I had when we had that workshop, as all of you know, I was having huge problems seeing, and I was in awful pain, and I could not focus at all. And as my eyes improved, it, I really didn't get a lot of feedback from my community. We, to be honest with you, we had the least feedback out of my meeting than anybody's, but it's been gnawing at me because I don't want to have divisive language. Now, I did ask if we could put it on the agenda, and I don't know where for the workshop, and I don't know where the miscommunication was, but I was told no, that I would, I, I could call, I would have to call Mary to put it on, but that nobody was going to put it on. And my feeling was that I was real uncomfortable supporting the words the way they were. But, and so I was just going to say, let me recall it, because, and I thought I could do that at this meeting. So I'm happy for us to have the discussion at the next meeting, but I do think that words like dismantling structures rooted in white advantage, uh, it, it's dividing the community. And, you know, and so I do think we should it, uh, get input, socialize it, but I also want, it's so important that we have a statement that we can all move forward with. We need to undo a lot of what's gone on over the years. We talked about the parallel to students with disabilities in the past and how hard it was to move us forward on that. So I want us to move forward, but I don't want it to be divisive. I want it to be something that we can all embrace and move forward together with. No? So My hands here's, back. here's our options, board members. Um, hold off on the socialization for a minute because that's important that we discuss that. But if four board members agree tonight we can have it on the agenda for next week. We can have a special meeting for next week after the workshop. So we'd have an opportunity at the equity workshop to discuss it. And then we can put in, I can put an agenda item on that says the board will discuss and take action if necessary on the equity statement. So if you're all agree, okay with that, but that doesn't answer the, the socialization issue other than it gives notice to the public that if they want to come to the workshop and weigh in on the equity statement, they'll have an opportunity to do that. So if you're all okay with that, we'll get it on, we'll get on, a, we'll have a special meeting. If I see four of you that want to do that, under the, under, the, under the board policy, four board members can call a special meeting. I can call a special meeting or the superintendent can call a special meeting. If the superintendent's willing to put a special meeting on the uh, next week, then it's settled and we can uh, put that on there for, you know, for the agenda item would be to, to discuss and take action if necessary on the, on the equity statement and we discuss it at the workshop, which will happen before the special meeting. Okay, Ms. Ayala. For clarification, is there a number on how many hours were invested into the creation of the equity statement as it reads, where we workshop this available to the public, open to the public, open for changes, open for conversation, and nothing was done that was differently than what's written, and also nothing was decided to take it out to the community. I just need to clarify that because I sat in about, I think, 20 to 24 hours of my life collectively that there should be a blank check of my time refunded if we're not gonna follow through on the words we, we said we're gonna stand firm in our convictions to do. So I'm just confused. Can someone clarify to me the hours that were invested in creating the statement? Hours that were. I'm willing to say that. 
for me, I when and and we know that the um, it's the white advantage. I think I don't remember. It's like um, I think that because and again we had talked about it so carefully together that <clears throat> it wasn't offensive to me. But I've discussed with Dr. Fenoy. It's why I wanted to come next week and talk about it. This it's not to delay anything, but it is to think about. Do I want a, how you roll this out is very important. Do I want a pre-K or a kindergarten or a sixth grade student to say, oh, I am so bad, my skin is white? No, of course we don't want that. So this is not something that, I mean, I just think it's one phrase that it bears, it's not stepping back from at all, but is if it is, we need to talk. I mean, we said that we were, you know, socializing it with the district meetings. Again, I knew that wasn't the place for my district. I want to be face to face with everybody all together. So I, I don't see a problem with, I, frankly, I'm irritated with myself that I agreed we would just go ahead and vote on it. Um, so I don't think that one phrase is stepping back from everything. You know, board members, you know, this isn't the first time that collective boards have passed statements or policies that have unintended consequences. You know, I know this board and our intent was to recognize the challenges that many of our children face and to take every and all uh, steps necessary to make sure that all of our children had equitable outcomes in their education. So allocating resources uh, to make sure that that happens. Unfortunately, this situation, as, as Ms. Brill says, it's created more divisiveness and polarization you saw what happened tonight. We had hours and hours of this in this community already. To put this on top of it is just, it, 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 it's, it's an untenable situation. We need to discuss this and take out the words that are incendiary. Many of you have gone through the Racial Institute training. You understood what white advantage meant in this policy. It is not clear to the public at all. From the emails we're getting, from the comments that I'm getting, uh, the comments that some of you are getting that I understand you're all getting too, uh, the public doesn't understand that that, what that white, it's in the eye of the beholder. And when you heard the gentleman tonight, white advantage to him is uh, the, what is that called, that race theory, the whatever that is that he mentioned. And, you know, we've been, you know, declared Marxists and communists for, for putting this in here. So I think we need to discuss it at the workshop next week and make some decisions on whether we can find a better way to make sure we're clear that we want every child, whether they're, whether they're white, they're black, they're, they're, they have struggles because of their, their native language, uh, their ESC children, their gay children, they get religious persecution because they're Jewish children or Muslim children. I think it's important that we understand that that was the purpose of the equity statement. It wasn't to make this a black and white issue, which is what the, per, what the perception now is in the public that we've, all the other good stuff we had in the equity statement with that one line in the middle, dismantling structures rooted in white advantage has turned it into a racial statement that is not going over well with the public. This country is so divided already. The country's divided, the state is divided, the county's divided, the cities are divided, and this school district is divided over this. I think we need to make sure we discuss it next week at the workshop, come to some decisions on what we wanna do, and then vote on it at the, at the, work, at the uh, special meeting to be held after the workshop. Ms. Brill. Thank you, so I really wasn't looking for us to dissect the whole thing, actually. I thought it was an easy fix. Maybe I'm, I'm thinking it's too easy because by taking those words out, we're saying the school district of Palm Beach County is committed to transforming our system by hearing and elevating un underrepresented voices, sharing power, recognizing and eliminating bias, and redistributing um, resources to provide equitable outcomes. I thought that the meaning basically stayed the same with the elimination of just those seven words. So I'm happy to talk about it at the next meeting. I do think we've captured all the groups, but it was just those few words that I think are the ones that really incite the most divisiveness, the most polarization, and the most discomfort. And you know, so that I thought it was an easy fix. Perhaps it's not as easy, but I really wasn't looking to spend hours discussing it. I'm hoping that I'll be able to see it <laughs> when it's up on the board next week, because that'll be my challenge. But, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that you will take a look at what was highlighted and reread it and, and maybe realize that it's not going to be that difficult. Ms. Ayala. 
Yeah, I completely agree and understand that the issue was the rollout and implementation. We were all in those meetings, like pull the tapes, pull the audio. Not one person disagreed with what is written on this paper. So I'm just, I'm finding it hard to consolidate that. And the issue is that confronting racism is uncomfortable. As soon as we get criticism and feedback folding under the pressure, instead of analyzing how we could have done a better job to give clear direction to our administration is not the option. So I, I'm interested in having a conversation about how can we implement this in a way that's appropriate within our district and do the educational and do the work to get to these standards that we're laying out that we're not even close to meeting right now. But I'm not interested in a conversation where we bring this up and it's a pathway to dismantling the whole thing and taking us back to where we were. I need to make that very clear because I remember the conversation, our consultant, the superintendent, various other folks told us, this is bold. Are you all sure you don't wanna take it to the community and no one spoke up? And suddenly we do, and I'm just confused. Ms. Ayala, I don't think the public knew about this statement until it was disseminated. That's when they found out, when it was put on the district website, when, when, the, when the district sent it out to the principals, the principals sent it out to the, to the parents, and that's when the parents in the community actually found out what we put in this statement. Otherwise, those people that called in, I didn't have the meeting because I knew that they weren't gonna talk about this. They were gonna talk about masks, which is what we saw tonight. They were gonna talk about social distancing. They were gonna talk about all the stuff that they're concerned about the health of their kids in the schools. They could care less about this equity statement at that point that we were doing those community meetings. So it, it, it didn't become an issue until it went out and everybody got to see it. So, you know, I think the fix is, I don't know what, why we're gonna have any more discussions tonight. The fix is we have a workshop next week. We can discuss it at the workshop. We have a special meeting thereafter. If the board during the workshop wants to make some changes, we'll have the opportunity to do that at the special meeting. And let's just end this discussion tonight. We have a whole next Wednesday week and do whatever, whatever we want with this at that point. I suggest that we make sure it's advertised. Carol, the best way we can get it, maybe Mr. Superintendent, since it went out to all the principals to start with, they should be notified that we're gonna have a workshop on the equity statement so they can get the message out that people can come and talk to us at the workshop and at the special meeting. Uh, to give us their views on the equity statement so that we have, you know, as much informed, uh, you know, as much information as we can, we can get from the, from, from the, from the constituents before we make a, an, another decision on what we're going to do with the statement. Ms. Ayala. Respectfully, all of the meetings were publicly accessible and viewable by the public, every single one of them. And I also didn't agree with the fact that some virtual meetings were not held for the opportunity to have this discussion that was made member by member. So that has to be notified to the public too, because in my conversation, it didn't get derailed by masks. We had an honest, open conversation about the future of our district. And so that's the truth, that's the facts. Thank you. Do we have a consensus to do this next week at the workshop? Yes. Show of hands. I thought you were agreeing or not agreeing, so go ahead. Dr. I'm sorry. Ryan. So um, actually, I think that I agree with some of what everyone has said, including Mrs. I Ms. Ayala. Um, you know, and we did say, I remember I said that this is, these are bold statements. Are y'all comfortable with all this, right? And I was actually trying to backtrack to figure out exactly like how all that got in there. But, and, and I think, no, but whatever. But, but this is the point, I think for me, I'm gonna go back to my portrait of a graduate and I know it's late and I know we're tired, but I think that if we had, and it's water under the bridge, but if we had had, if we had arranged this so we had a shared conversation about the minimum expectations, the minimal experiences and competencies we want every child to have coming out of our high schools, that people would understand where, where we're trying to go with equity, right? Because equity is about giving each child what they need to get to this mark or above, right? Um, you know, I knew when, when we voted on that that some people weren't gonna like that statement. You know, I thought everybody was good with it, but I think next week's, the next workshop on equity is the right place to have that conversation once again. All right, board members, let's move to BD4, Mrs. Andrews, Baker Act. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I put this on and I've been spending quite a bit of time talking to the general counsel. I spoke to the superintendent. He didn't have anything to offer because we had been in a cone of silence. I think we still are in that 
But I'm really concerned, and I think I was concerned when it first came up, because I don't want to think that we're still Baker acting children here in Palm Beach County Schools, putting them in handcuffs and hobbies and in the, in the back of police cruisers and taking them to the mental health center. And so I've spent quite a bit of time talking to the general counsel about what the uh, process is as it relates to uh, what the Southern Poverty Law Center has said to us and what are we doing to improve. And uh, she has indicated to me that she will speak on this tonight for the public as well as for me and the rest of this board on how we can get the information about where we are here in the school district of Palm Beach County as it relates to children being Baker acted as well as uh, what happened with the Southern Poverty Law Center and what methods have we put in place to improve ourselves. So through the uh, chair, uh, could you uh, ask the general counsel to speak on that? And I know you're with me on this item here, but that's... Yeah, Mrs. Ms. Sanders, uh, I've had discussions with the general counsel on this issue, and I understand that you, your office is putting together a policy to bring before the board on how we deal with the, with the Baker Act situation. One of the concerns I had is, you know, I was told initially that we couldn't discuss it because there's a lawsuit. And, you know, sure. if we wait till the lawsuit's over with, knowing how attorneys act, and I am one of them, this could be three years before the lawsuit's settled. And in the meantime, we've done nothing with respect to the problem. So we need to get a policy in place. One of the things that I felt strongly about is I want documentation by the principal at the school that the parents were called. I want, I want to see documentation. I want to just hear that we try to get the parent. I want to see documentation. We tried to get mom on the phone at 11.57 a.m. She didn't answer. We tried dad. He didn't answer. We tried again three minutes later. We called the emergency contact number on the card. Nobody answered that number. Before we Baker Act a child, we need to make sure the parents are absolutely understand that their child is in a, in a distressed situation in the school, and, and we're looking for some guidance from the parents as to how to handle that before we send them off keeping in mind that we don't have a choice under state law when a child is Baker acted, they have to be handcuffed. I don't like it. Certainly the, the thought of a five-year-old being Baker acted out of an elementary school, handcuffed behind his back, even though they're not handcuffs, they're the, the strips that, you know, that we're all familiar with, those zip strips. But, I mean, just the sight of a little kid getting into the back of a police car with, is, is sickening to me. And my understanding was that we had, uh, I think Mr. Tierney told me today, it was called the Global... Uh, uh, wasn't a crisis intervention team, it was a global something team. My understanding was before a child was Baker acted, there was a team of people in the school that got to, the, to make a decision whether that child should be Baker acted or not. And then I find out that those people all have other jobs, so they can't be called together quick enough to make a decision. So it's now it's, it's the fault of the police department. When, when, they keep, when the police get to the school, the only one that can Baker act is the police officer. There is no crisis intervention team that's been there because they're all somewhere else. And so the police officer has no choice. The principal says, this kid's out of control. We need to get him Baker acted. We need to get a policy in place so we know exactly how we're going to handle those situations. Well, before we get to the policy, let me say this. So I'm very proud of the work that the team has done. So what we're going to do is that I know we're prohibited from talking about it through the general counsel office, and I respect that. But I can schedule a meeting with each one of you, with Dr. Dr. Sheffield and her team, to go over all of our new processes. So if you're willing, you can have those individual meetings that are not done publicly so that you can get all of the latest information. We are willing to set those appointments up for you. Mrs. Andrews, was your question? Yeah, that's what uh, the general counsel had indicated that she would be willing to do that because I have not had a sit down with anyone. I would like to know what happened in the past. You know, we are a big district. I would want to know the data as to what happened, if it was happening in in, in, in different districts and in, in, in the elementary schools. We only got the information from the Southern Poverty Law Center and we got generic information basically from us on that, you know, some of that was not correct and, and we didn't do those things. So I just really want to know what we did and, and did we do it correctly? If we didn't, how are we trying to uh, uh, correct ourselves so that it won't happen again? And I'd like to know where the schools are. The training is a big component of it, that people need to be trained. General Counsel, the only problem I have with individual meetings is we're basically, the superintendent's been polling the board, right? He's getting the, the position of each one of the board members before he makes a recommendation. So can't we have a workshop on this? Well, my advice on this remains unchanged. And so, you know, I would advise, given the fact that we have pending threatened litigation, um, you know, board members, I can state on the record, as well as district staff, 
have been advised that they should not be commenting on this issue. Nothing about that has changed. Uh, there's a team of 18 lawyers on the other side um, who have sent out correspondence. Um, my office has reviewed that correspondence after repeated requests by my office for information. Uh, this same team of 18 lawyers has failed to provide sufficient information to my office. Um, and so with that, I am unable to advise the board on the merits of their threatened lawsuit. Um, what I can also say is that I am impressed uh, by the significant improvements made by the district related to student mental health over the past couple of years and that we look forward, as the superintendent uh, has suggested, to collaborate with the board and with the district on policy training modules. We're going to be working up a policy that should be coming soon. Um, and I expect there will be this opportunity for us to meet individually with board members along with the administration to maintain the confidentiality uh, that is allotted uh, through the attorney-client privilege. And so, as the superintendent uh, stated, we will be able to meet with you individually along with staff so that you can get the information um, that you all have been asking for uh, because that information is there. There's a lot of information uh, that it has not been reported. Um, and I think that it is better not to speak publicly on it until you have all of the information. Okay, so you're suggesting that we have individual meetings to, d to develop a policy that you're going to bring before the board that we're not going to discuss the policy publicly other than to say we agree to vote for it. Is that what no, you're suggesting? No, that's not what I'm suggesting. The policy piece absolutely should come forward by way of a workshop. But as far as the individual facts, the data uh, that has been, the issues that have been raised by the 18 lawyers and the Southern Poverty Law Center, those specific facts we will have to discuss in behind closed doors individually with you, uh, with members of my team along with members of the administration so that you can get all of that information while remaining under the bubble of the attorney-client privilege. I, I, I I think we're saying two, some, two things differently. I mean, Marsh, Mrs. Andrews and I would like a workshop on the Baker Act policy, on a Baker Act policy. I'm not asking you to give us the facts on the lawsuit that, that has okay. been potentially filed, and neither is Mrs. Andrews. We just want to know, can we have an open workshop on a policy for how we treat Baker Act, uh, when we're going to Baker Act students on our, off our campuses? Absolutely, and that policy work is underway. Okay, so we can schedule that without these individual meetings. Now, the individual meetings, can you briefing us like you always do on yes. potential litigation individually, or if the lawsuit is filed, then we can have a closed, closed session. Closed session, correct. But until that litigation is filed, you, you're going to meet with us individually, give us information so we know what's going on. So at least we have that in our mind when we're voting on the policy or we're at the workshop on the policy. Correct. Okay, all right. So, Mr. Superintendent, if you can get that, is it okay, board members, if we schedule a workshop on the Baker Act policy, Mrs. Dr. Robinson? I'm fine with that, but as part of that workshop, I think I need to see the continuum of services that we have in place that should be designed to prevent a child from getting to the point where Baker yes. Act would be considered. And I think that could be part of the workshop yes. where the staff you know, gives us all that info. Mrs. Whitfield? Thank you. I just, I want to be very careful that we don't that we don't put ourselves in a position where our words are used in a in a lawsuit, and and I and I'm very worried about this workshop for this reason. Um, I think the only way we can pull off doing it is if general counsel is very clear and guarded during that workshop that we don't say and stop us. If there's yeah, a way, if the board can agree to stop us from talking when we're going down a dark road. Yeah, good luck there, with that. There will certainly be. <laughs> There will certainly be parameters around the scope of the workshop uh, because the, the, the workshop should be limited to the, the policy um, with respect to Baker Acts. Um, 
anything outside of that, and, and um, I would imagine that we would be meeting individually with board members prior to the workshop so that the board members, too, can have an understanding of the difference between the two and the parameters um, of what's uh, specific to a policy versus what's specific to the lawsuit. Okay. All right, so we're okay with that? All right, we, uh, we need a meeting to, a motion to adjourn. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, seconded by Ms. Ms. Ayala. All in favor, opposed? <laughs> Meeting is adjourned.